Imagine you are a race team, you lose the most popular driver in NASCAR. That alone should be the unanimous worst season in your entire history, right? Well, for DEI, Teresa Earnhardt and Max Siegel, they would manage to make their follow-up 2008 season even more of a disaster in every facet you could think of. NRF Productions proudly presents Dale Earnhardt Incorporated 2008, a NASCAR nightmarish outcome. The Kannapolis, North Carolina race team had a new number one. Not in the sense of car number one, because that was still driven by two-time Nationwide Series champion Martin Truex Jr. 2007 was his sophomore surge, any burdens that Truex carried of potentially being another Reed Sorensen, a NASCAR bust for all of us to see, it was relieved for now. The rise of Martin Truex Jr. had been something truly incredible as in just a few years, he went from sleeping on Dale Jr.'s couch to outperforming him in the Cup Series driving equal equipment. Alright, alright, alright Junior Nation, let's be fair here because we have to take into account that Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s 2007 became pretty much a reality television show especially when his request to have at least 51% stake at DEI was rejected. Instead of becoming Martin Truex Jr.'s boss, the guy that signs his checks pays the bills like a chance to, Jr. was now off to Hendrick Motorsports. The thing you have to understand about DEI in 2007 is that it was a year of change. Some of the reasons why they would shake things up is because of Teresa Earnhardt's negligence. Others were marginal gains to try to make the team just a little bit better, improving by 1%. Nothing flashy, just solid progress. Their engine program merged with RCR to become ECR engines, the powerhouse that they still are today. Midway through the season, they merged their operations, pooled their resources together with Ginn Racing, the runners-up in the 2007 Daytona 500. Dale Earnhardt Incorporated not only acquired new people, new ideas to help make their race cars faster and more competitive, their new assets acquired in this deal helped DEI give their drivers a clean, fresh slate, namely Paul Menard. By missing the Daytona 500 and six of the first 16 races, he had dug himself a deep hole. I may or may not have stolen this idea from Fox. With the acquisition of the 14 cars owner's points, Menard no longer had to twiddle his sideburns stressed out about making the race. He could just show up to the racetrack focused on race trim, focused on getting the best results on Sunday. Dale Earnhardt Incorporated hoped that long term this added track time would brighten Menard's future because his paint scheme, it couldn't get much brighter. What are you going to do, add more neon red? However, even with all the competitive teams, that extra top 35 slot still wasn't their biggest acquisition from the merger. The U.S. Army 01 team was grandfathered into the DEI fold. It was a ride anchored by the last guy you'd expect to fight on the front lines in Iraq or Afghanistan. 49-year-old Mark Martin fit more of a general role as a leader of his team and a mentor to younger drivers. Still, of course, pondering retirement, what is this, like the second or third retirement tour he's on? Mark Martin in 2008 would race a part-time schedule. The driver joining him on Team Army would be NASCAR's Cuban missile, Eric Almirola. He officially had his big break to learn from a driver like Mark Martin all the prestige and experience he carries. And he would also learn from a crew chief like Tony Gibson, experienced at his craft. Rounding out the four-car stable would be Regan Smith, or in the words of NASCAR Twitter, they've nicknamed him R-E-Q-A-N Smith or R-E-Q-A-N-O-N Smith. I don't know how they came up with that. Dale Earnhardt Incorporated in this season seemed to like the Ginn Racing prospect to the point where they thought Regan Smith was going to be closer to their next Dale Jr. than their next Steve Parker Jeff Green, based on the fact that they were going to run the 01 car full time in 2008. The main storyline of this entry wasn't an inexperienced driver with minimal cup experience. 
Regan Smith wasn't exactly the easiest guy to sell to corporate America. This is long before the R-E-Q-A-N-O-N stuff. At the time here, NASCAR costs were rising due to the Generation 5 car and all the massive safety advancements. And with a lack of sponsorship, the industry questioned just how long could DEI run this fourth car. DEI's president, Max Siegel, still felt that their driver roster was strongly constructed. The blend of young drivers with the veterans would move the needle from them in this post-Dale Earnhardt Jr. era. They would go from a team that you think is going downhill to one that you knew was going to be a contender every single time they showed up to the racetrack. That was not what DEI would get at Daytona as they only had one finisher in the top 20 for the Daytona 500. Like in 2007, Martin Truex Jr. had himself a sluggish start. Still, this wasn't enough to get his confidence down because you had several rays of sunlight shining down on this third year driver through compliments from peers, close friends, and the industry as a whole. Let's just say that there was a routine stratus cloud in the way clogging up, making a few things uncertain in Martin Truex Jr.'s future. Martin Truex Jr. did not have a deal for 2009. While DEI had made their decision, they loved having Martin Truex Jr. on the team. And because of that, they picked up his option for 2009. Martin Truex Jr., however, had to agree to the terms which he had yet to do. After all, the New Jersey native's future was bright. So bright that he had the leverage to choose and pick wherever he wanted to race. While Martin Truex Jr. tried his best to focus squarely on the racing, how could you not ignore your future, especially when you've got your entire career ahead of you? A big decision was on the horizon for Martin Truex Jr. DEI faced the same cloud of uncertainty on the economic front. Caro One, to put it into simpler terms, was just making it by. They had a two-race sponsorship deal with Coors Light, and they had a friendlier deal with a multi-race sponsor, Principal Financial Group. For most weekends, Regan Smith's car was unloaded off of the DEI truck with the team logo on the hood. To make matters even worse, crew chief Doug Richard abandoned the team, which meant that Dan Stillman picked up the weight of guiding a rookie driver whose career was financially on eggshells. And considering all the rigorous conditions that Regan Smith had to face, he did an exceptional job keeping this car in the top 35. He toughed out this tough situation by logging all the laps, staying out of trouble, and learning the most important thing as a rookie driver. Amidst all the trials and the tribulations, there was one steady rock for DEI. Car number eight continued to carry the torch like it did when it was painted cherry red. By the way, facts only here, Mark Martin watched a handful of races from his living room sofa. Even then, he still ranked 24th in the driver's standings on the back of five top 10s in his first 11 starts. Man, if only Max Siegel could convince Mark Martin to unretire for the third time in his career. Ultimately, because of his performance, Mark Martin was convinced that he could run for a championship and have a career resurgence. That man would be Mr. Rick Hendrick. Officially halfway through the 2008 season and now, Mark Martin was officially in a lame duck year with DEI. Tensions were starting to rise within the organization. Not a single driver was signed on to their program for 2009. Max Siegel needed to make a move and make it fast. So who do you lock down? You have Martin Truex Jr., your new franchise face. Should be an easy guy to lock down, but ultimately he was still undecided on his future. You've got the driver that's funding your cars out of his father's pockets. Ultimately, no, that would not be the driver either. Or you've got the guy you must think is your next Dale Earnhardt Jr. because you are funding his full-time rookie season out of your own pocket. It would ultimately be none of the above. In terms of the short run, Eric Almirola made the least sense of the four to get an extension. Sure, let's not deny that the Cuban Missile had potential to wreck his competition. However, he only had a sample size of five races and those starts were average, mediocre, nothing really to ride home about. The primary reason that DEI signed him on for this full-time season was because of his age. Almirola at age 24 would have been eligible for conscription if the United States had faced any sort of global crisis that required more troops. 
Eric Almirola was more representative of the Army and the demographic they were targeting. DEI had found their perfect fit for the Army, however, did the Army see DEI as their perfect fit? The U.S. Army's NASCAR deals were signed on a year-to-year -year basis. While yes, they were in talks with DEI to remain past the 2008 season, the NASCAR Silly Season rumor mill linked them to Toyota, namely Bill Davis Racing. So locking up Eric Amarola this early was a financial risk for DEI. If it worked, Army in a heartbeat would re-enlist with DEI and its young prospect, if not, the organization would have themselves yet another Regan Smith situation. So losing Mark Martin to Hendrick Motorsports officially meant that DEI president Max Siegel now had an extra $8 million. He could officially pursue any driver he wanted, and ultimately that driver would be the one that he had yet to sign. Martin Truex Jr., he would try his best to convince him to stop and stay a while. Albeit, the negotiations were a pain for Truex to deal with. For both parties, it seemed best to get the deal done so that they could focus on making the chase. However, the fireworks were only about to start setting off for Martin Truex Jr. And it wasn't just because it was 4th of July in Daytona. On Thursday afternoon, his primary car didn't meet the roof templates. NASCAR was generous. They let the one team try again, go back around, see if you can fix the car, come back, we'll inspect it again. When the car failed the second time, NASCAR was fed up. The officials confiscated the team's primary car to get taken back to the R&D Center. Martin Truex Jr. was furious with his race team. If his season wasn't as distracting enough with the silly season circus around him, now the one team would have to go through the appeals process just to try to save their season. The commission unanimously upheld the penalties because the rules were clear cut, Despite the rebuttal from DEI that the modified roof flaps were a disadvantage according to their wind tunnel research, if losing 150 points wasn't severe enough, Crew Chief Kevin Mannion's role for the team in this stretch run, their critical part of the season, was going to be bringing them coffee and donuts. So Martin Truex Jr. was like an airhead, officially ready to burst with how DEI had treated him in 2008, Reportedly, things officially boiled over when Max Siegel reported to ESPN that Truex had signed a two-year extension to remain with the team through 2010. Truex Jr. had so much fire and fury in his belly from that report, as he would reportedly get into a raised voice spat with Siegel that night. Like Robert Yates Racing before them, DEI was at odds with their superstar driver. Unlike Elliott Sadler, Martin Truex Jr. had a plethora of options, including the 20 car at Joe Gibbs Racing where he would become teammates with Denny Hamlin and Kyle Busch should it happen. Sound familiar? All the NASCAR journalists had their stories typed up, but just didn't know when they were going to schedule it. The headline reading, Dale Earnhardt Incorporated releases Martin Truex Jr. from his contract. And ultimately, this would be a story that would be put into the trash bin. I don't know how it happened. Maybe Max Siegel promised Martin Truex Jr. a new tackle box or something. Because during Watkins Glen race weekend, Martin Truex Jr.'s 2009 plans were solidified. Remarkably, a one-year deal was struck between Truex and Siegel to keep the two-time Nationwide Series champion in-house at DEI for 2009. Officially, the simplistic New Jersey native that grew up in the fishing business was now ready to get his head back into the right place, which would be the racetrack. Martin Truex Jr. went out that same weekend and got a top five finish, just one of five top 10 finishes in the last 15 races, subpar for what was expected of Martin Truex Jr. in 2008. But for DEI, it was miracle work that he would end his 2008 season committed long-term to racing Dale Earnhardt Incorporated Chevrolet Impalas. For Dale Earnhardt Incorporated, they could now focus on fielding four teams, four full-time teams for 2009, namely Truex in the 1, Elmerola in the 8, Menard in the 15, and Smith in the 0-1. If it wasn't those four drivers, some of the names rumored to be joining the team were Robbie Gordon and, yes, Rusty Wallace, pulling NASCAR's version of Brett Favre. 
It seemed that Paul Menard's future at DEI required you to purchase a pair of sunglasses. His 2008 statistics reflect what happens when you guarantee a young driver into the race. After competing in all 36 races, even winning a pole award, Paul Menard finally had the confidence to get out there and compete at a high level. Couple in all of the Menard's money, retaining him did not require more than two brain cells. Paul Menard needed to be back in the 15 for 2009. And Paul Menard agreed. He was in awe of what Max was doing with his organization. Well, Max Jones and Doug Yates. I don't know what Paul Menard was seeing in Robert Yates Racing because this wasn't the same team that won races and championships in the 90s. Dale Jarrett left all the way back in 2006 and took his big brown truck with him. Every person of significance saw the writing on the wall with this team and found employment elsewhere. The fact that Dale Earnhardt Incorporated lost Paul Menard to this iteration of Robert Yates Racing that said a lot about where the organization was heading. That same day, it was rumored that Army did not renew their deal with Dale Earnhardt Incorporated. A few weeks later, Army officially announced that it had enlisted Ryan Newman and Stuart Haas Racing to its NASCAR program. Without a doubt, September 30th, 2008 was the worst day in DEI history. Okay, yeah, losing Dale Earnhardt Jr. stung from the PR perspective of things. That alone damaged their reputation in many ways. However, losing two primary sponsors would take the cake. As if funding the 01 team out of their own pockets for Regan Smith wasn't bad enough, which almost paid off for them at the 2008 Talladega Fall Race, Regan Smith made one mistake on that day, not sending Tony Stewart into the catch fence to clinch his first career victory. He would ultimately respond to the ruling in the way NASCAR Twitter would expect, denying the results. Where do you feel like you should be placed? Doing burnouts out there right now. One of the only rays of hope for DEI in this season was Regan Smith. This random Canadian karting champion managed to win Rookie of the Year, doing this by beating out a three-time IndyCar champion that had Penske sponsorship and resources to his disposal. You know what was even more impressive? Ultimately missing some Cup Series races due to DEI putting Ron Fellows in the car and then not running the 81 for Regan Smith, even by missing time, he completed more laps as a rookie driver than Matt Kenseth, Kyle Busch, Jeff Gordon, Casey Kane, Ryan Newman, and Denny Hamlin. Just naming some of those names and thinking about how he was inexperienced, it is just something that is phenomenal. Regan Smith, in many ways, is one of the most under-respected drivers, but that's for another day. Teresa Earnhardt and Max Siegel could not afford to lose Regan Smith. Wait a minute, hold up for a second. Let me take out some words and rephrase that sentence. Teresa Earnhardt and Max Siegel could not afford Regan Smith. As if losing two major sponsors made the goal of having a four-car stable hard enough, now you add in a U.S. economy in a recession. Because of that, Dale Earnhardt Incorporated's empire crumbled. Three drivers, two full-season sponsors, and their best crew chief, they all opted elsewhere. Even worse, General Motors went on a $10 billion cost-cutting spree. And to cap it all off, DEI shop on the Monday after Homestead was littered with pink slips. Like they aspired to in the beginning of the season, DEI concluded their 2008 season number one just not in the way they expected as they would lead NASCAR, the NASCAR Cup Series, in most people laid off. The organization that strived to thrive was now in survival mode entering the 2009 season leading Teresa Earnhardt and Max Siegel to cross paths with another organization that was wrecked on and off the track by also a nightmarish outcome. If you enjoyed this installment of the Nightmarish Outcome series, check out the one on Evernham Motorsports 2007 or see how Goodyear in 2022 made races at Martinsville and Bristol a chore to watch. Other than that, this is Nathan for NRF Productions, Life's a Beach, and then you drive.